Hello, this is Foreign Policy Focus, episode 170, and I am the show's host, Kyle. On today's episode of Foreign Policy Focus, I'm going to be discussing Vladimir Putin's re-election as Russia's president and where U.S. and Russia's relationship stands. More sanctions imposed by both countries against each other and the U.K. nerve agent allegations are certainly causing a lot of turmoil between those two countries. But the first thing I want to discuss is the Yemen War Powers Act that was just voted on in the Senate. I watched it live. It was a hard thing to watch, so uh, I'm going to be talking about that first. For those of you who want to share today's episode, and getting the word out is important because the U.S. government is doing a lot of terrible and dangerous things, and it's in our name and with our money. So foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com. Or you could go to libertarianinstitute.org and the show is both on the homepage there under its own little widget on the side or uh, at slash Kyle's. So the Yemen War Powers Act today was tabled uh, by the Senate, effectively killing the bill. The motion was proposed by Senator Bob Corker, who argued that the support the United States is providing to Saudi Arabia and that coalition in the Yemen civil war does not rise to the level needed to invoke the War Powers Act. That motion carried 55-44 and the bill was killed. So since that was what killed it, I'm going to talk a little bit about and debunk that myth first. And then I'm going to get into my, you know, my thoughts on the whole thing. Uh, the first thing I would say is that if you want a more detailed account of what's going on in the Yemen Civil War, check out Foreign Policy Focus episode 159 titled Yemen Cheat Sheet. And in that show, I give a pretty thorough and I think a pretty good pace breakdown of what's going on in the Yemen Civil War. To understand why Bob Corker and the rest of the Senate was wrong to vote in favor of this uh, mo- motion to table, we gotta go back to the War Powers Act, which was passed over Nixon's veto to establish Congress's role in the war-making powers of the United States. In the War Powers Act, the President of the United States needs to seek congressional authorization in order to support another country waging war, as well as to to go and send U.S. troops to a foreign country. Now, this could come in the form of a declaration of war or an AUMF, which we have seen passed in 2001 uh, to fight the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and 2002 to fight Saddam Hussein. Congress has never passed any authorization for the United States to wage war against the Houthis, which is the main enemy of Saudi Arabia and the target of their war in Yemen. However, the United States has been helping Saudi Arabia enforce a blockade of Yemen that is targeted at the Houthis. The United States has provided bombs and military equipment, billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars since the start of Saudi's involvement in the Yemen civil war. We have provided Saudi Arabia with critical mid-air refueling that allows Saudi jets to remain in the skies a long time above the uh, cities of Yemen and, and target and bomb northern Yemen. When without the U.S. provided mid-air refueling, that ability would be severely limited. The United States also provides critical maintenance on the Saudi air fleet, allowing their planes to continue to be prepared to fight in the war. And we also help provide intelligence to Saudi Arabia and help them to you know, do the logistics of the flights and everything like that. So it's pretty clear that the United States is 100% supporting and in a lot of ways enabling Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen. Without that mid-air refueling, the Saudi planes would only be able to stay in the skies in Yemen only minutes at a time. And then they would have to return to refuel. Now they're able to stay over the skies of Yemen for hours at a time, returning several times to get, you know, new fuel from the U.S. KC-130s that uh, do the mid-air refueling. And so I, I think I pretty clearly there made the argument that this bill certainly rises to the level to meet the war powers act, and the Senate was 100% wrong in tabling this legislation. Uh, obviously, I think there's some good things here that, you know, Senator Sanders, Lee, and Murphy introduced this bill, and it was co-sponsored by several other senators, including mine, Senator Warren and Leahy. However, at the, I mean, at the same time, it was, it ended up being defeated on a lie. And the worst part about it is this means that America will continue to support Saudi Arabia's genocide against the people of Yemen. The fats are out there and the senators are more than capable if they don't already know of what Saudi Arabia is doing and the suffering going on of the people in northern Yemen. A cholera outbreak that began in late last April infected up to a million people. Right now there's an outbreak of diphtheria that has already infected at least 1,300 and has killed 70. People in Yemen are starving to death. There's 250,000 children that are currently severely malnutritious. 
meaning that they could die at any time uh, from starvation. I mean, if you look at the pictures of these kids, it's absolutely horrific. Uh, you could tell that they're much older than they you know, actually look or they're you know much younger than they actually look uh, one way or the other the aging process makes it go you know uh, you could see their bones every time their arms their legs uh, you know their knees protrude from their legs and i mean you know and we know in the united states and we know how important not only prenatal care is but that you know young babies get the correct medicines and get the right vitamins and the right foods and and all the right vaccines and everything like this and how important that is to a child's growth and future success in life it makes a, a big difference in in the development of a human if at you know a young age that child is provided with the right vitamins and nutrients that you know are best enabled the process to grow and this is absolutely beyond being deprived from an entire generation of Yemeni children. We know about the, the psychological warfare that, you know, the air wars, you know, wage on people. Uh, constantly wondering if your house will be the next one to explode. It's constantly that fear that a, a bomb could be dropped on you at any second. Because like I said, the Saudi planes remain the skies above Yemen for a long period of time. In a separate war, the United States is raging in Yemen, a drone war. We have a, a psychologist, and this article was published in the Rolling Stone, uh, detailing that up to 90% of Yemen children suffer from PTSD-like symptoms uh, that was brought on by the United States drone war. Uh, I've seen reports that Saudi Arabia will fly their you know, F-16, F-15 jets over large crowds of protesters in northern Yemen and create sonic booms as they're doing it in order to you know, scare and strike fear into the Yemeni people. In, in this kind of you know life where there's constantly explosions and bombs going off and you're just hoping to make it through the next day has to be an absolutely traumatic and impossible experience for a child to grow up in. Saudi Arabia is absolutely decimating the infrastructure of Yemen, uh, destroying roads and bridges, hospitals, ambulances. One of the things that Yemen is able to export is, I believe, cereal and their cereal packaging factories in Yemen. And these provide critical jobs to people. However, some of these factories have been destroyed. Uh, sporting complexes, schools have not been spared. Weddings and funerals alike have both been destroyed. And all this has been done with the support of the United States of America. Of course, we also help to support the Saudi blockade of Yemen that prov that prevents few food, fuel, and medicine from reaching the people of Yemen. Unlike the rest of the Middle Eastern countries, Yemen doesn't have vast oil reserves, and I don't know if there's really any oil access to the people of uh, that's currently controlled in the area by the Houthi. I think most of the oil that is in Yemen is more towards the east of the country. And so fuel is critical if you need to drive your car to get to the hospital, especially with roads and bridges destroyed. This means that you could be traveling. As Will Porter explained in his article on the humanitarian tragedy of Yemen, uh, suddenly it's a 10, 20 hour drive to the hospital. And imagine if you don't have the fuel you need to get there, it, it could be nearly impossible. And even small injuries are now causing massive amounts of death in Saudi or, or in Yemen. Fuel is also important, you know, to creating energy, running the hospitals, running the generators, other places, uh, keeping the lights on, making sure it's not too hot, too cold, and also to run the water treatment facilities. And as I detailed earlier, cholera, a waterborne disease, spread like wildfire through Yemen, infecting up to a million people and killing thousands. Yemen, before the war, imported around 90% of its staple foods. Commercial imports to food have pretty much been cut off, and there's a couple of reasons for this. In the early days of the Yemen Civil War, Saudi Arabia targeted a port that's key to bringing uh, any kind of commerce into northern Yemen. This is the port of Hadeda, and they destroyed the cranes on that port. America pretty quickly rallied to get some new cranes, but Saudi Arabia prevented them from being delivered for nearly three years. And I think it's only very recently that they allow those cranes to uh, be operational. I think these are moving cranes, which have advantages and disadvantages that they could be moved. So maybe they're less likely to be bombed, but then they could offload less cargo now. So bombing the port and destroying the, the cranes was certainly a, a big hindrance to the ability to bring commercial food and fuel into Yemen. But at times, Saudi Arabia has completely blocked 
commercial f- food and fuel from reaching Yemen. And then even sometimes uh, for a complete month, I think pretty much the whole month of November, the Yemeni people weren't even allowed to have humanitarian aid relief fu- food and fuel. Saudi Arabia has blocked ger- uh, journalists from entering Yemen as well. I believe it was 60 minutes or another similar uh, show was their journalists were blocked from entering Yemen. And so they gave their camera crews to aid workers who were able to go in. Of course, aid workers haven't been spared by Saudi Arabia either. And there's been reports of uh, Saudi Arabia bombing Doctors Without Borders facilities. So I say all that just to make it very clear that the United States senators had an absolute ability to stand up for what was right today. Uh, they had the ability to do something good in the name of the American people and attempt to end a war. We may, may not be able to completely prevent Saudi Arabia from attacking the people of Yemen, but we could certainly limit their ability to do so and help the people of Yemen to have access to food and fuel that they need. Uh, I mean, even if you disagree with the the Houthi militia, uh, the the Zaydis are a small ethnic group in Yemen, and it seems that a lot of people have only rallied around the Houthis because of their anti-Saudi sentiment because of the way that Saudi Arabia has uh, treated the people of Yemen here. So the thing is a complete mess. It's completely stupid. We could have, you know, if you're a Republican, you could have said, oh, it's Obama's war. If you're a Democrat, you could have said you voted against and you invoke the war powers that act against the evil Donald Trump and his expansionist wars. I mean, you could have sold this either way. Uh, it could have been great. But at the end of the day, Saudi Arabia buys a lot of weapons. They pay a lot of lobbying groups in the United States. And those groups pay the U.S. senators and fund their campaigns. And so, you know, I guess it would have been a vote against their own pocketbooks and there's not many people willing to ever do that. All right, I think I covered it and that's pretty much all I have to say on the Yemen situation. I know it was a lot, but I want to run through some news about the Russia stuff. Vladimir Putin wins re-election. This is his fourth term as president of Russia. This is his second consecutive term. I guess by the Russian constitution, a president could only... Uh, be in office for two terms in a row, uh, then they have to take a term off and not run, and then could then run again. The last time Putin wasn't president, I believe the man's name was Dmitry Medvedev. People saw him and labeled him as a sop puppet of Putin. I think it would be worth my time, and I'm probably going to do this in the coming, coming days, to research, research and see how much that is the case. Uh, sometimes these things get overstatement, and there's key differences between the two. Russia's presidential terms are not four years, but six years, so this means that Putin's term will run through 2024. I don't think there was ever much question that Vladimir Putin was going to win this election. Uh, His polling numbers in Russia are typically very high. Uh, Of course, Russia isn't a completely free society, and I'm not trying to go down this, you know, demonization of Russia road, but there's certainly been suppression of protesters in Russia, and at times those protesters have been completely peaceful. And while I don't necessarily want to endorse the ideas of Putin's opponents because I don't know who they are, are, are really, uh, it does seem to me that he has, uh, you know, what to silence people. I, I think the man's name is Alexei uh, Nitovli and, and people like that. Once again, not not to say that these are just people are, you know, their voices necessarily deserve to be heard, but it does seem that Putin is uh, targeting these people. Uh, depending on where you read your news about Putin being reelected, either the uh, vote was read by Vladimir Putin or this was a open and free election. Of course, the truth is somewhere in the middle there. As I said, Russia is certainly not a free society, but it does seem like that of the people that decided to go out and vote for president, uh, 76 percent of them more or less voted for Vladimir Putin. After being re-elected, one of the things that Putin talked about was that he's going to look to cut Russian military spending. Uh, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's interesting that the rhetoric in Russia uh, you hear from Vladimir Putin is typically that he's looking to cut military spending when the United States were always looking to increase it. And even if the senators don't actually plan on increasing it, uh, especially if you're a Republican, the rhetoric is always to go towards more defense spending. So I don't know how much things really change 
uh, in Russia or between Russia and the U.S. with Putin being re- re-elected for a second term. Like I say, I didn't, I don't think anybody was under the impression that, Ru- that Putin was in a, uh, chance of losing this election anyways. And so I guess he just kind of continues on and everybody continues on business as usual. Uh, one interesting thing that the election brings up is that, uh, it seems to be kind of a ritual thing that once somebody's elected, world leaders call and congratulate. So this means that Donald Trump I would guess he picked up the phone and called Vladimir Putin and said, congratulations on winning. And one of the things that Trump said, and uh, I want to get this right, is he said he wants to speak to Vladimir Putin about the arms race. So I find it interesting that Donald Trump didn't warn this, uh, warn this at all as we're going to look to stop the arms race or prevent or look to, uh, you know, draw down on arms. It was, you know, we're just going to talk about the arms race. So that, that seemed to be an interesting way to phrase it. But if, if they're going to be talking about it, it's a good thing because if they're not talking, then they're just building bombs. So the Trump administration, I guess, finally rolled out sanctions against Russia as a response to Russia meddling in the U.S. election. And there's 24 sanctions. And I think most of the people that are sanctioned are either involved or companies associated with the Internet Research Company, uh, which is accused of meddling in the U.S. election uh, by running pro, not even pro-Trump ads anymore. It's just disinformation type ads and information that somehow caused Donald Trump to win the election. In response, Russia says that they're going to blacklist some Americans and some American companies. And so as I talked about in a previous episode, this kind of gets us into the whole downward spiral of relations. We're going to sanction you, so then they're going to sanction somebody else. And it just ends up, you know, kind of spiraling it and more and more, uh, less diplomacy, less talking, less things moving in the right direction. I want to update on the UK nerve agent attack. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who is a opposition leader in the UK, is saying, uh, not so fast, don't be so fast, could condemn Russia. If he's taking a stand on this, I, it seems to me to be an indication that the UK doesn't have uh, definitive evidence that Russia uh, carried out this attack. Now, there's a very interesting thing that we need to note here is that there's a treaty that both the United States, Russia, and the UK are signatories to on chemical weapons. I believe this is uh, the treaty that calls for all these countries to destroy their chemical weapons. However, there's a procedure of what to do if a country is accused of carrying out chemical weapons attack. The country making the accusation has to provide evidence to the country accused And then that country has 10 days to come up with some kind of response. So what we had Theresa May, who's the UK Prime Minister, do is not follow this treaty. Uh, She decided that she was going to say that Russia was guilty and that Vladimir Putin has 24 hours to provide evidence that says that Russia didn't do it. Of course, Vladimir Putin said, you know, provide evidence that we did it. And this is somehow proof that Russia definitely did it. But anyways, the the UK is violating the treaty because they're not providing Russia with any evidence or any samples of the nerve agent that's allegedly used. Uh, and it, it's, there's a lot of things that are head scratching about this case, especially the fact that the people it's supposed to haven't died, even though this is supposed to be one of the most deadly nerve agents on the planet. I mean, this was supposed to be more uh, deadly than either sarin or Vietz. We also know that the UK hasn't identified who the assassin even was or uh, ha- apparently uh, c- uh, captured this assassin in any way. And so, you know, it seems har- ha- awfully hard to even, you know, condemn Russia when you haven't provided any evidence whatsoever that Russia did it. Even though you, you know, all they could point to as well, we say it was a Russian uh, nerve agent that was used and it was a Russian guy that died. Last thing I'll know is that the EU and NATO have come out in support of the UK's claims against Russia. Of course, one of the problems that I think significant things about NATO uh, making this condemnation is, of course, the Article 5 agreement of NATO that says that, you know, one country could invoke the rest of the country to take up arms uh, against an attacker. And so if we see that happen, uh, we could see the United States then feeling treaty bound to, in, in some form, uh, take action against Russia. I don't think that necessarily means that it has to be military action, but it could be. I'm going to go ahead and save the Iran and North Korea stuff I have for Friday's show and just uh, finish up with Syria. The first thing I want to say is that on the last show, I have mentioned that an Afrin hospital had been bombed by Turkey and killed nine people. Turkey is now contesting that claim, and I haven't seen any evidence uh, to make me believe 
Um, the claim by the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights that the hospital was bombed and that they haven't refuted Turkey's claim. So it may not be true. And I just want to uh, put that out there. Other things dealing with Syria. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster says U.S. troops will remain in Syria until Syria is stable. In one way, I kind of dismiss this because H.R. McMaster is rumored to be on his way out. But at the same time, he's pretty much been rumored to be on his way out since he got in. So who really knows? In Afrin, we have lots of reports of mass looting by the FSA and Turkish soldiers. Of course, you know, like I was saying, this is a, they're conquering the Kurdish territory. They're not liberating it from terrorists like Erdogan, uh, explains. And the last thing is, is that now Turkish Pre- President Erdogan is saying that he wants to move the YPG off of the entire Syrian Turkey border, which would mean a lot more fighting and, uh, it would put the U.S. in quite the, uh, awkward situation there. Very last story I'm going to talk about. We have a UK woman who went to fight for uh, the YPG or the Syrian Kurds against ISIS, ends up dying in an airstrike by Turkey as she was going with uh, a YPG all-female fighting group, I guess, to support the the Kurds in Afrin. And so it's just interesting how that works out, that she goes uh, to the Middle East to fight a, a very villainous opponent in ISIS. And, you know, I don't want to necessarily say anything bad about her because hell i mean you know going taking on some of the worst people isn't a terrible thing to do uh, especially not when it's through a massive bombing campaign by a government but it's really weird that you know that she ends up dying in a missile strike by a nato ally of the uk so i don't know just one of those stories about the middle east and about the syrian civil war that just seem to make no sense in a lot of ways just like the united states support for the saudi war in yemen we're doing it to placate them still you know why are we starving all these people to death all right that's where i'll wrap up the show for today foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com libertarianinstitute.org immersionnews.com for the brand new news website got a ton of awesome stuff up there i'm on twitter at k-y-a-a-a-l-e and the facebook page is libertarian union